Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I want to persuade you why you should pay attention for the next three quarters of an hour, perhaps. If we're lucky, if it goes well, it's three quarters of an hour. If it doesn't, we're out of here because there's other things to do. No, quite seriously, the economy is falling apart, some people say, or it's not quite working as it should, yet other people say. But there is widespread dissatisfaction with the shape of the economy at the moment, especially nearly 10 years after the financial crash. So it seems right and good and proper as a use of your next 45 minutes to learn something about different views of how the economy might work, a sort of pluralistic vision of the economic situation rather than a, a sort of monoculture which we seem to have at the moment. And with me I have Henry Lucen Gower, who is an economist of 25 years standing, who has worked with uh, government departments, has worked more broadly and more effectively in later years in trying to, s to get people to discuss economics from a variety of perspectives. So uh, I'd like to welcome you, Henry. Thank Hi. you very much. It's great to be here. Yeah. It's a great place. Uh, well, it's the Isle of Wight, and everybody knows that's, <laughs> that's the place to go. It's a bit like you know, Lord of the Rings. You've got to go to the island to find the secret. Ah. Uh, well, that's what I'm told anyway. <laughs> that, that, that makes us feel better. Now, pluralistic economics. I want to start with something about how we talk about economics. Now, I just want to give you an example from the BBC this morning. And if you're watching this on Catch Up, folks, it's not going to be relevant. Uh, the BBC said, the budget is today, and the budget is really important because we're in quite a fix. We have a you know, public deficit of whatever it is, and um, this ought to come down. Uh, but at the moment, it might have to go up a little bit, but we've got to be really careful about the choices that the, that the government makes. Because, you know, we've got to try and eliminate the deficit and hopefully at some sp stage pay back the, the debt. Huh? I think this is a strange story. What's your view on that, Henry? Yes, it's, it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what money is. Um, because it takes this sort of picture of us in being in a household, looking at counting up the, uh, the pennies and how much we've got, what's in our bank account and so on. Uh, whereas what we're really talking about is a, is a mechanism, a social mechanism, a social tool that should help us work together across the economy, across the UK. Um, so it's really a function to, to allow people to know, to make commitments, to do things to people in the future, uh, to be able to create things, to make things happen mm. and so forth. And, and, and being a wonderful social institution, our government, our, our bank, can actually create enough of it to make happen whatever needs to happen. So when you've got a lot of people who actually aren't doing a lot, who are sort of wasted resources are, who are neglected and then uh, by uh, making money available it allows things to happen to create new businesses energy um, rather than leave people unemployed on the side mm. so it's not about somehow saving to pay back it's about a, a useful social mechanism that should work properly so this misunderstanding actually undermines sucks all the money out so that people are left uh, uh, on the edge and, and these are the people of course who voted Brexit. So this <laughs> fundamental misunderstanding yeah. of how, economy, uh, how money works is actually to some extent responsible for, for, for a lot of the fix we're in. Yeah, and I've even heard it, it said in one, in one view of um, economics that the government creates whatever it needs and if it needs to adjust the price level, you know, if inflation is getting a bit higher, they just increase the taxes a bit. To do that, they can bring the, the flow of income and expenditure back into line. There's no in principle yeah. reason why they couldn't create additional um, spending power in the economy and uh, as long as you say it doesn't go to fueling housing assets or something fixed like that if it's productive yeah it's very good and yet that framing of that government is like a household is fundamental to a lot of policy decisions because people go oh, yeah that's true it must be like a household we can't spend what we haven't got that's as you say confusing money as a commodity in a fixed supply it, it shows the power of stories, actually, and the economists uh, are beginning to understand that uh, the stories or narratives that we tell that sort of un help us understand the world and actually sort of shape the world we're in are incredibly, can be incredibly powerful. And so much so that politicians who really know better 
feel unable to tell different stories. Um, you know, feel that they'll be told you're being irresponsible or, you know, you're, you're a bad economist and so forth. So, uh, I mean, I think Ed Miliband struggled because he felt constrained by a set of stories that boxed him in. Uh, that if he started actually telling the truth, mm. he'd be sort of written off mm. um, as not being a proper economist. Mm. So stories can shape our minds, can narrow possibilities. And I think a lot of what economic pluralism is, is a way of sort of breaking out of these narrow frameworks, these narrow narratives which constrain us, make us, it actually impossible to do something that's useful, creative, to get us out of the fix that we're in. And that fix is not just a lot of people left on the side and discarded, mm -hmm. it's also an environmental fix. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's highly relevant to the idea of a circular economy, uh, because of course we live in a linear economy. And uh, if you're going to do a truly circular economy, you actually have to break out of a lot of the narratives, a lot of, you know, the idea of business cases, the allowed to just providing for shareholder value. There's so many sort of concepts that block us in, which we take for granted, they're like sort of furniture that we're just familiar sitting around with, which are actually deeply misguided and, and constrain the possible for us, possibility for us to survive as a race. Yeah, you, you were saying something when we were having a little chat before about the use of the word incentives. Uh, it's almost a, a trap, I think I was getting the sense from you that it, it, it shapes your thinking very firmly. How, can you explain why it's even using a word like incentives yes, it's, or, it's or business that, case? I mean, or? It's, it's, it's fascinating that incentives has become so pervasive mm. uh, as, a, as a phrase. Uh, that I mean, the, the immediate response, for instance, to the crash was, oh, we got the incentives wrong. If we could just redesign bankers' uh, bonuses mm. so the incentives were in line, it would all be sorted. And that's a very strange idea because it's sort of saying that people are like this sort of um, responsive, obviously self-interested individual that responds. You just, you sort of, they're like puppets, if you like, and you get the prices right and then they move to a different direction. They have no sort of internal motivation, no values, no sense of ethics, no sense of morals. Um, but if you bribe them in the right way, they'll do the right mm. thing. But if they don't have that bribery, they won't. Mm. So it's like they're having you at, uh, you know, under your control and say, well, we're going to screw things up unless you pay us. Yeah. And it's a bit like actually uh, uh, environmental, you know, paying people not to pollute. It's like, hey, we're going to pollute unless you pay us. Mm. And, and it sort of creates this dynamic where there's no sense of what is the right thing. It's almost laughed at, you know. I mean, I was on a, a stage at uh, the Kilkenny Kilkenny Festival of Economics and Comedy, which is a great festival. I'll give them a little shout out here because I think you really should go. Fantastic time. And um, I was being, uh, when I was suggesting to a Harvard professor of economics uh, that we had to go beyond the idea of incentives uh, and think about how people actually des decide in, in terms of their values, in terms of what uh, uh, they should do, he said, well, that's just asking everyone to sing Kumbaya together. I was like, where did he get that from, I thought? Mm. You know, that somehow going out with this narrow framing that we're all waiting for incentives to be paid to do anything and otherwise we won't do anything means getting together and singing Kumbaya. Um, I, mean, I was just astounded and he kept repeating it. So, so his thinking had been blocked into this area and he didn't realise that, wait a moment, we're sort of brought up to have manners, aren't we? Mm. Uh, we're brought up to say please and thank you, to think of other people, to... Uh, to be responsible to take our place in society and, and have some sort of public perception. This mm. is just normal upbringing, we're all done. But somehow, we go into a business, we go into a business environment, we forget all that. You know, no ethics, this is an ethics-free zone. Mm. We cannot actually be ourselves. So I think we've created institutions, in a way, that are dehumanising. Mm. That we've created uh, institutions and rules of the game in places like finance, through financialization that are spread, which are inhumane mm. as such. They are amoral and they're rules that basically, if you start mentioning what the right thing to do is, or you know, what the problem with society is or how we should contribute mm. to them, you're laughed out of court. Mm. You've just broken all the rules of, uh, of that institution, of that politeness. Yeah, picking up on, on, on language and, and framing it to another level, and I, 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 take, I take that point, that's very interesting. But what sort of, I'm not even gonna, uh, I won't even use a word because then I'll use a different frame, won't I? How has pluralism manifested itself? Because you've been involved in this and some of the initiatives that are attempting to make 
the, the learning or the study of economics more pluralistic. What sort of interesting ideas have come out? I heard you mention uh, uh, rethinking economics, and uh, could you tell me? Because I'm also interested as they got a festival around comedy and economics. <laughs> I don't think this would have been a big seller uh, pre 2008. Well, this is amazing. You know? There were thousands of people there, and I think there's there is a process where I mean, sometimes it's called the new economics movement. Um, and I think it's particular amongst the youth because uh, it's clear to them it's not working. You know, the, the people, it's clear the economy is not working for mm -hmm. them at all. No. And the, the, one of the key narratives that was obviously the Thatcher narrative, we were all going to own our houses, take out mortgages, live happily ever after and so forth. Uh, and that's what people were sold. And suddenly the new generation, that's just not an option. So what do you do when that sort of fundamental sort of nature of how life is meant to play out is removed from you? And actually, interestingly, I think it's created enormous amount of innovation mm. and new thinking, new ways of doing things um, that actually could be incredibly powerful. So it's sort of ironic sort of action and reaction that but actually removing this sort of linear projection of how the normal life should be actually creates space in itself yeah. for innovation. And I think the students, I mean, have been incredibly powerful in um, re rejecting the sort of teaching they were getting at school, starting in Manchester, but it, now it's spread to an international movement, universities all around the world, with an incredible amount of energy um, to, to, you know, to change. But the response of academia has generally been, you know, not a lot, really. Uh, I mean, there's a classic sort of term in, uh, in sort of innovation theory called locked in, isn't there? Where uh, it's not just the technology, but all the institutions and, and the power and the interests and so forth sort of conspire mm. to lock you into a particular way of seeing things. Mm. And I think that is what has happened in academia, mm. that, uh, you know, to get on in academia, you need to be published in the top magazines. Uh, sorry, journals, I have to call them oh, journals, yeah. journals. Oh, sorry, not <laughs> magazines, not mere magazines, <laughs> journals. And all the top journals, to get published in them, you have to meet certain rules of what mm. economics mm. is, this very narrow perception of what economics is. If you don't get published in these magazines, you don't get promoted. Um, so, and all of the top names are people who have made it in that way of seeing the economy. Mm -hmm. So all these people, their whole reputation, their whole status relies on a sense that that is the way to do economics. Mm. Uh, and they have also, developed skills in a particular area, usually mathematical modeling, which are very niche and actually have no real application outside mm -hmm. that field of economics. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't really understand any of the other branches of economics because they've never been taught them. So there is, you know, other branches, behavioral economics has sort of got out there, that's beginning well known, but that sort of reason they can deal with that because it keeps the idea people are individuals. And it basically says actually people quite often aren't just, uh, are not really rational, mm -hmm. actually they're they're often stupid. And actually economists, academic economists, I think feel quite comfortable with the idea that most people are stupid. They manage to hold, amazingly, I think, two sort of ideas in their head. One, that they're incredibly rational, and the other thing, they're incredibly stupid, because of course they're very intelligent and know the answers, and most people don't. So uh, behavioral economics they can cope with. Um, then there's institutional economics, which gets into a whole different area of actually understanding social structures, rules that guide behavior, and actually suggests, well, it's not all about individuals. Mm. It's actually about tribes, about belief systems, identities, which are collective. Mm. Now, if you start talking like that, you I mean, you're a socialist, aren't you? Uh, I mean, that sort of goes well beyond. Uh, and then there's complexity economics, there's feminist economics, yeah. there's post-Keynesian economics, yeah. Mar Mar Marxist Marxism. economics. Yeah. Marxism, now, that is, that's like sort of farting in public mm. uh, for economists. Uh, that is, you know, if you mention that, I mean, that's really way, way yeah. out there. Well, perhaps we shouldn't perhaps just mention that for a minute, but I will come back to complexity economics as yeah. an example. Because a lot of what, what we try to do in the foundation is around trying to apply some aspects of complexity to resource flows, materials flows, and um, things like that. And it's interesting though that complexity, if you're dealing with materials flows, is something that's interesting. You know, how do things connect to feedback rich systems and how does it work at all levels? But it sometimes seems like you, one tries to attach that to an, an economic modeling, which assumes long-term equilibrium, where people are psychic because they can anticipate all of their future, <laughs> yes, yes. future demands and uh, whatever, way into the future. Yeah. And sometimes it feels a little bit uncomfortable because one of the hearts of complexity economics is saying, this is a bigger picture, these things matter, these things are involved. 
and yet with much conventional economics you're locked into money flows yeah. you're locked into things which are fairly tightly defined and so sometimes that feels a little bit uncomfortable but we are in a process of helping influence change one hopes and that, that yeah. that's why it's particularly well, I think uh, complexity, to economics, get your view on that. complexity economics uh, has got a lot of traction, mm. uh, more so than institutional economics, which is, a, I think, an interesting phenomenon. Complexity economics has also, a lot of the practitioners have come from the natural sciences, uh, physics, maths, mm -hmm. um, and actually sort of ironically, uh, mainstream neoclassical economics tends to use out-of-date mathematics. Um, uh, and so a lot of more up-to-date mathematicians have come along and say, hey, come on, that's all old stuff. Uh, you know, and complexity economics has come out of actually more sophisticated mathematics, computing technology as well. Uh, I mean, uh, agent-based modeling is the type of modeling done to understand complex systems, and that can require quite mm -hmm. a lot of computer power. Uh, and now that wasn't available a bit no, back. No. You know, some of these agent-based modelers have banks of computers equivalents up in the cloud. Um, agent-based models can have thousands, millions of, of agents. Mm. Uh, and agent-based modeling, it's a very simple idea. It's sort of, you know, it's what it says on the tin, basically. It's about agents, people or organizations that interact mm. um, together over time. Yeah. And over each time step, they change and, and interact. And they mm. can actually, what is incredibly powerful with these sorts of models is that they can be linked to other physical mm. models, spatial models, mm. and so forth. So understanding an, uh, a circular economy where mm. space, physics, and these things are important, you can sort of put these models together. Yeah. Um, Do you think they have to come together at some stage? I mean, oh, this yeah, is, um... absolutely. I mean, I did that uh, in government. Uh, I. Um, uh, commissioned and managed a whole modeling process where okay. we linked an agent-based model to a model of hydrology in a catchment. Mm -hmm. So the rain rain, the rivers ran, the groundwater filled up, and then there were agents, farmers, industry, uh, who took the water out, they built reservoirs, mm -hmm. uh, they traded water, they, they grew crops, they, mm -hmm. they created stuff, water companies built things and so forth. It created a sort of virtual reality, if you like, and that's probably where things are going, actually. Mm -hmm. That we're actually moving away from these, you know, models that mathematical models no one really understood unless you were a sort of techie geek to models which actually play out i mean a bit like um you know before you allow a, a pilot to fly a plane they fly the plane in yeah. virtual space they test it out so the equivalent is going in models where we have models that produce virtual worlds mm. and we try out policy interventions or actions and so forth in this virtual world to see how it how they'll work out before we do them for real and leave people in a bad, you know, in a bad space. Just picking up a little bit more on that, why, why do you think that the existing story is so sticky? Because it's almost, uh, somebody described it as a utopia, the, the story about the economy, because if you fit the economy as these um, parameters are described in the sort of neoclassical model, everything will be really well, and yet it's almost impossible not to notice that these are not realistic. <laughs> And yet people go, oh, well, you know, we just got to make more effort. Um, maybe we haven't suffered enough yet to fit, <laughs> fit the model. What's your take on, because we're talking about stories and change. Yeah. It's interesting it that so um, people are almost uh, told they're bad consumers. You know, be more like the model. Uh, you know, we expect you to consume in a rational way and check all your prices. And if you don't, you're stupid and we reject you. And the fact that you're losing out and, uh, and the energy companies are taking for a ride, well, that's your problem because you're not acting like the model says you should act. Why, why do these stories stick around? I mean, there's a fascinating story to the whole, you know, where neoclassical economics came from that goes back to the 30s and the sort of dominance of a lot of think tanks. And you notice there are a lot of sort of economic think tanks mm. still around who, who play out this story. So influencing um, the, uh, the politicians. Mm. Um, so, and this was quite a lot of this was um, deliberate, you know, it, it, they believed the world would be better. Yeah, uh, it yeah. wasn't necessarily the, uh, some sort of conspiracy yeah. uh, to sort of take over the world. It wasn't a sort of Dr. Evil sort of story. There are also possibly Dr. Evil stories that bright people who had a lot of money recognize that actually this sort of story is quite convenient. Mm. Uh, I think it's convenient because it actually says um, free markets are, are a good thing in itself. And actually, uh, there are people, uh, uh, the Koch brothers in, in the US who set up foundations, charitable foundations to promote free markets. Mm. Now, of course, 
it's not totally a coincidence <laughs> that free markets are things that they rather win at. Uh, and, and the basic thing about free markets is, uh, or the idea of free markets or something that verges is that if you control the resources, you win. Um, so it, it works for you. It also hides, it tends to, the, the, the story tends to hide un, un, convenient truths like you know inequality, which mm. has sort of got forgotten. Um, so typically, actually, people are now sort of economists are admitting that uh, the whole argument for free trade, for instance, ignored winners and losers. I mean, obviously, this has come somewhat out of Trump. Mm. Um, but actually, standard economics could show that people could win and lose. Overall, everyone was better off, it mm. claimed. Uh, but there was clearly winners and losers. But that was sort of hidden away. We were just not focused on. Um, and, and so these things could be forgotten about and hidden and and also it became a sort of justification um for for the the rich people making money i'm just you know doing what's the the right thing i'm trying to make profits yeah. that's a good thing so it lionized the rich and powerful and obviously then you've got a, this coalition between the idealists with an idea to save the world with this new way of thinking and a set of um uh, powerful interest that it benefits. There's a third element, I think, that um, there was a crisis in the 70s, obviously, uh, and a crisis in economics and a crisis in the economy. Um, and as a result, people were looking for solutions. And this was a sort of ready-baked solution that had been developed, which could easily be sort of just handed there. Here, the answer. You've got it. Now, um, at the time, therefore, a few key players like Lucas and others suddenly were, were heroes. Uh, uh, they had a, a huge amount of authority mm. very quickly. Mm. And that is quite a dangerous thing in that, uh, and this is a, a famous paper last year by Roma, the chief mm. economist at the World Bank, who you know, tells the story of the fact that these people suddenly were cult figures almost. And then they had a following. And even though, because they'd been quickly adopted, all the cracks begun to show and, and the problems, they had a whole following who, were, who spent their time and energy papering over mm. the cracks. Mm. And because all the governments are taking it on and become the new idea, everyone, everyone was sort of in, in a conspiracy of silence, if you like, because no one wanted to say the emperor didn't have any clothes. Um, um, so it's only now that this is the great significance, I mm. suppose, of the crash, which it revealed something that we sort of all yeah. knew, um, but brought it to wider attention. Yeah. To, to, to pick up on the story angle, I, I've, I'm very interested in what Mark Blythe is a sort of economist from the US. Yes, no, I've and, he, and I think he used to be a stand up comedian as well. Well, yes, he does. He's, he's, he's a very amusing it, guy yeah, from the north as well. All right. So <laughs> it from, must be good. <laughs> yeah, from Scotland, so it's oh. really genuine. Oh. Uh, but he was saying that there, there were, as you were saying, just basically two stories for the society after World War II. One was jobs and growth, but government will make sure there's enough expenditure in the system to make sure it all happens. And yes, we do need more educated people, so we're going to get increasing wages, increasing productivity and all of that. Yeah. And then when uh, that fell over a bit, or uh, had some uh, severe problems, should we say, at the end yeah. of the 70s, uh, the same story continued. It was jobs and growth, but we'll do it by making sure in the price level is held down. You know, We'll use more market efficiency yeah. and we'll let the financial system be creative now and, and that will work. Yeah. So if in 2008 this sort of got a comeuppance, you know, it, you know, both systems had value in a sense that they worked for, for you know, large numbers of people at different times. But if it falls over as it seems these things do uh, periodically, we're not really sure what the new story is, are we? Because if it used to be jobs and growth and you look at the level and rate of growth in all of, say, OECD countries, it's on a downward um, yeah. trajectory. And jobs, there might be lots of jobs, but they're often low productivity, part-time, zero mm. hours. Do you have a sense of what, from your work, what story is emerging about the economy? Because we need, it seems, mm. a societal story. I think that's right. Uh, uh, and obviously we're at a, a sort of early stage and we don't have anything, I don't think, sort of pre-cooked in the mm. way that the the neoliberal camp or neoclassical camp had in the in the mm. 70s and and that's been pointed out as you know as a, as a, as a, as a huge challenge um, my sense is that the the, the new story that that comes out has to be around the idea of um, people identity uh, collective action um, and it's interesting actually Matthew Taylor uh, in his uh, recent commission on work for instance uh, what he sort of identified was that the thing that affected most was the instability, the, uh, 
the lack of uh, any sense of what happens next. It, it sort of takes you back to the days when you know the working class, the, uh, uh, the dockers all turned up on the uh, the, uh, the side uh, mm. by the ships, and, yeah, and sure. they didn't know whether they were going to get a job. No. Um, and I think living with that instability, uh, you get a text now. You get a text now if you've got a job or not. <laughs> and that was the big problem. But some societies, and I would imagine at that time that the, the Docker society was a very strong, cohesive society, yeah. managed to cope because they actually helped each other. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, the idea that maybe it's not, you know, it's not material goods, it's not forever growth and so forth. Actually, what we really need is recognition, solidarity, links, identity, feelings of belongings and these sort of things. And I think on the face of it, we are going to go through a phase where, uh, you know, we, we've spent all the, uh, the carbon uh, um, and we've built up, both we've built up a climate change huge problem uh, and uh, suddenly the energy we need to get energy out mm. uh, has become greater and greater. So we've sort of blown the inheritance. Uh, we got this, you know, big sort of knock of carbon uh, uh, and, it, and we've created a wonderful thing mm. out of it, but it's all, it's sort of close to have gone. Um, and so the future does look more challenging. So I think uh, the story that has to grow is one of a more collective public uh, uh, sort of uh, identity of working together to of mm. keeping things together and and obviously that plays into the environment as well yeah, but, but, the, but not by microwaving over the remnants of Keynesianism from the 70s as somebody <laughs> pointed out because just warming up a, a no. an old ready cooked meal is not the most uh, it's not I think we do thing. need new stories obviously Kate uh, Rayworth um, uh, has you know, create a lot of those uh, stories about a different sort of economy. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think firstly, we have to got, get away from this idea that economics is about allocating scarce resources, mm. to that actually economics is about how we organize ourselves mm. to survive, create, to flourish, and so forth. Mm. So it's about our interactions. And so issues of trust um, and togetherness become key because uh, it's very easy to do a deal or work together with someone you trust, you believe in, you recognize, you identify with. Uh, but if you don't trust them and you feel they've got it in for you, then you get dislocation. Uh, yeah. And this, the technical economic term is transaction costs, mm. um, which has been something that has had a focus in the past and it's yeah. been forgotten. And, and now we're seeing the one thing that we can be certain about in terms of Brexit is there's going to be a huge transaction cost. All right, well, let's see about the transaction costs for me at the moment as I switch to my colleague Sophie, who is going to tell us more about what's happening in the remaining action-packed full days of the diff. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Henry, our lovely speakers. Um, please bear in mind, dear audience, this is already week three of the diff. We're coming to an end. But this week, we had a number of sessions about uh, redesigning everything in relation to the 21st century economical question and our one of our third, uh, three themes. So from this session that taught us what, on a Monday, that taught us uh, how to learn and what, what the experience was from a financial crisis perspective and where to go from here, we had speakers such as Laurie McFarlane and Hunter Lovins. We've learned that the economy has changed in ways we might not notice straight away. And this gives us an even greater chance to rewrite the rules within it. Uh, an interesting topic uh, I would like to dig deeper in within this session, Henry and Ken, because it's quite it's it's quite a good question for us millennials, and I've um, put a little bit of an effort in for finding uh, those questions and topics, topical themes within our so uh, audience. Uh, Sophie, why don't you come and join us on the on the couch, as it were? Much easier this way. Hi, Henry. <laughs> Ken. Hi, I do that way. I think I think we would. <laughs> We're two men uh, of a certain, <laughs> certain age, and I think we need more gender and you youth balance. Cue. Yeah, well, I got the cue for that. Well, this is fair enough. Yeah, Sophie, this is a lot Sophie easier. works works uh, with us, and uh, and so it's a bit of a, a sandwich. We've we've got Henry in the middle here, and we've got <laughs> two people really interested. Can't get in, out now. Yeah. <laughs> more so questions. You're but you've got some questions that uh, have yeah. come up, not only your own, but people who have been. Uh, writing in so yeah I think I mean coming from the discussion the two of you had uh, which is a bit more big picture level maybe we can move on to the more practical questions and I think what uh, Laurie McFarlane said I'm just gonna read it out is 
The financial crisis was a product of the system we currently live in, but challenges such as poverty and equality and so on cannot be separated from an economic system which breeds them. So to overcome these issues, civil society must go beyond simply focusing on symptoms and start tackling root causes. And from that, I know that you said before, the price of, or talked about the price of being a consumer. So the question that's interesting is how to engage with identity of not just your consumer, but the citizen. So what are the key examples you would name that are happening already of, of practical tools and how to change this, address this? Well, I think some of the interesting stuff is happening about how people organize enterprises, how people work together and so on. Because uh, we've got, in the past, there was a sort of classic idea that you have a uh, a company uh, with shareholders um, and you set it up and you get financing and, and, and so on. Um, and then people are, are creating new social enterprises. I mean, I think we now have community interest companies. Uh, so that, and people, I, I think, are beginning to think, well, they don't, they don't want to tread the, the old path of the standard way of, uh, uh, of focusing on profit, but actually want to do something that they can believe in, that, uh, that is coherent with their set of values. Uh, so I think people beginning to think how they work together, how they integrate their, their personality and their beliefs into what they do, I think is, is really important. And I think innovation in this sort of area is the sort of practical things that, uh, that, that people could do. Are there any examples of places to go or things to do for me as a, as a millennial? And if I want to get involved into economics? Uh, well, there's, um, there, there are a whole set of sort of movements, organizations. I think a very interesting one is coming out of Austria, actually, um, uh, Economics for the Common Goods that Martin Felber uh, mm -hmm. set up, which has come to the UK, which uh, is getting organizations to develop sort of um, social environmental balance sheets and, and re-see what they're doing in terms of their, their broader public uh, achievements and that's a very it's been a very powerful movement that spread I mean it's very big in uh, obviously Austria Germany uh, but also uh, Spain and, and South America and it's coming here uh, the B Corporation uh, mm -hmm. movement that's come here as we well heard about that last yeah. week as well from um, so and obviously there is there is a, a previous movement which was on the edge if you like the social enterprise movement cooperatives and, and, and so on uh, which was always you know in a sort of different world but I think actually we have to sort of bring them in to the the mainstream I think they uh, you know I'm working with organizations thinking about structuring organizations that are, are very different mm -hmm. um, so where would you go um, I think you know get involved with these groups uh, they have gatherings they bring together practical people who are who are doing you know setting up businesses um, I think B Corp had a, a big event recently, a uh, festival where they brought people together. Um, I think the thing is to go and look for these organisations and join mm -hmm. with them because we, we, we're trying to innovate and do things differently and we can only really do that by learning together and trying things and forming networks and showing that together that it can be different because otherwise we're always vulnerable to the fact that the mainstream holds all the cards uh, and they're very powerful and they want to continue the same story because that's the story they've lived with, mm -hmm. particularly as older types, you know, who've come to tell us a story that we've been doing the right thing. You know, they, the bankers are able to get up in the morning and believe they're helping the world. Uh, and they've managed to get them to that place and they have the power. And they're not really very keen for a whole new set of people to say, well, actually, no, you know, what you've been doing has been the, the root cause of the problems that we're facing. So it's only by building alliances, building groups, movements, and establishing a presence, mm -hmm. uh, a strong uh, presence and solidarity that I think change can happen. Okay, great. I think, but talking about bankers, that leads me on to the next question, uh, which is, is a similar group of institution or an institution, the economists. So is it not an economist's responsibility to involve the general public? And how can we create that accountability? I think absolutely. Or the um, bankers' accountability. Does it just mean to focus them on a certain new language that we speak, the narrative? Can we capture their understanding as well? Well, let's start with uh, economists, uh, because I think that is really important, an important strand of the student movement mm. challenging 
uh, economics profession okay, yeah. was saying that economics had been a power for a, a power against democracy, that it had technicalized the language used by politicians and excluded lots of people. Economics, firstly, we know is incredibly dull, so people get put off. I don't want to, it's all numbers, graphs, it doesn't mean anything to me, leave it alone. But that was convenient for the people who actually mm. were there because no one was then watching what they were doing. And they used the power of technical language to exclude people so that people didn't really understand, but they were the, effectively the victims. So we have to reconnect people with economics. We actually have to make economics interesting and engaging so that people will find about, out about it, will learn about it, because it matters for our lives. And the great organisations that have been doing that, economy, E-C-N-M-Y dot org, which came out of the student movement, mm -hmm. that is all about trying to engage people, the, to, to try and say, well, you are in the economy. It's not some mystery. It's not, not a lot of numbers. It's not models. You are actually in it. You have an understanding. You have an intuitive understanding of how it works. And sort of re-empowering people to, to get involved in economics. The RSA, the Royal Society mm -hmm. for Arts, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, they are running a, a, a citizens' council on economics. I was going to speak about that. Yes, uh, and so that's another great initiative to reconnect people mm -hmm. uh, and empower people to be able to talk about the economy because it's, it's been taken away from us. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been told there is no alternative. I have the answer. You have to fit with my rules. And if you lose... It's your problem because the markets are just. If you failed, you are a failure. So people have been sort of told that they're failures because the market determines. The market, this powerful beast that we cannot control, that we are all victims of. If we succeed, we are powerful, we have lots of money and we are listened to. If we fail for whatever reason, then that's our fault uh, and we deserve the results. So this is the story we've been getting. And we're not really told, we're never explained the truth. It's all technical. You'd never understand, dear, with, uh, would probably be the, what they'd say. So I think there is a huge need to reconnect uh, economists uh, with and challenge them, for people to challenge them, explain. You're just giving me gobbledygook. With, with the public or yeah. with my age group. Yeah. Well, all around, I think. I, I was just going to, to chip in with this idea that we... David Orr said it a long time ago, he's an environmental education uh, expert. He says, we know what we're against, but we're not able to say what we're for. And I think this, yeah. this sort of conversation is, and this, the, the reactions from students and others is trying to reach towards that notion of what are we, what are we for, mm. so that it becomes a, a different sort of utopia, actually. I don't mind utopias. Because they have a function, uh, according to Milton Friedman anyway, which is two functions. One is to say whether you're getting closer or away from it. And secondly, it's for something that can be pushed into the system when the time is right. Mm -hmm. And time right always means, according to Naomi Klein, uh, when there is a crisis real or imagined. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you like, it's like a precondition for substantial change is to know what you want and to have a times which allow it to happen. And I think we have to... We have to recognise that the people who are within the system that we find deeply problematic are human beings. And so, you know, bankers and economists are human beings. They, mm. they, they are caught, maybe, in a system that um, has forced them into a particular way of being. But, uh, and, and normally, as human beings, we have to justify our own existence. So if we get caught in a system that forces us to become a certain sort of person, then we develop our own narratives to say that we're OK, we're good, because we, we do, I think, as humans, want to be good. Now, this, the downside is that then we, people are bought into their own myths, and if they've been paid a lot of money, they must be right. But there are a lot of people, I think, in the finance sector that I've met who know that the system is rotten, that things are happening that are totally wrong. And they are the potential allies. If they're given the space to come out and find a new way and to do things different, that's where change could happen. But we can't, I don't think we should uh, demonise them. I think demonising them, uh, they are human beings. They're caught in a particular system. Uh, and actually, I think the finance system, banking, is quite brutal. It's a brutal system to be in. It's abusive. I mean, what other 
area of employment actually marches people out of the building with a security guard when they lose their job and they have only time to take their personal uh, possessions. You hear the stories of brutalized treatment. The, there was one story I heard when they were making a lot of people redundant. They got people into one floor of the, uh, the, the, the tower, the, this big building, and they split them into two groups. One group went into a lift that took them directly out <laughs> of the building, out onto the road, and the other group went up and they were kept. But it was this, this sort of really horrific treatment. So it, when you're faced with that treatment, you become quite cynical and you're, you're about, you have to survive. This is tough. Uh, you probably work very long hours. You probably uh, uh, don't see your, 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 your uh, children. You have money, so well, you try and make life, you know, you probably get into drugs to make things better. So I think we have to see that there are people who've been brutalized by systems uh, not obviously the poor and the, 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 the left out, but actually the, the people who've so-called done well yeah. also live in brutal systems. This is not working for anyone. So that we have to build bridges with the people who realise this and want to, uh, want to reform it. I think those are really, really crucial words and answered all questions I had further. Before I come to the final words, because we do have to wrap up, unfortunately, um, there is two things I'd like to say similar to the quizzes that we had with other uh, speakers so far. Uh, I'll, I'll put in some phrases and terms, and you tell me what you think. Just a first initial thoughts, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, economic democracy. What does it tell you? What is it? Great. It's about engagement, involvement in, in making our economic, e economy work. And what about we are all political animals? Personal is political, yes. We are all part of the politic and we have to recognize that and be part of it, indeed. I have to go back to that, yeah. I think, um, unless, Ken, any more, any more things that we want to wrap up with? No, it's, I think uh, Sophie taking it A away. lot of topics that we covered so far. Yeah. And I would, yeah, I'd really like to thank you for the discussion uh, and use the opportunity to mention that there is some sort of lead on to this topic on Friday um, uh, was in a session also featuring Henry on the topic of redesigning your economy with free companies that cannot be bought or sold. That'll be with Graham Boyd at 1400 GMT. It'll be a live session. I might be probably hosting it, so I'll see you again then. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you Thank very you much. much. Thank, Thank you so much again. Thank you, Thank you, Sophie. That's been a pleasure.